Hi, and welcome back to the History Machine podcast. This is episode two on the Greeks. So I suppose, how do we begin to talk about them? Where is our starting point? And that's probably with the Mycenaean Greeks. Credit to the Greeks for inventing things or coming up with great ideas. It's like a lot of that is probably... Cultural appropriation, for want of a better term. Basically, they, <laughs> probably the they way colonized that, lots of the Mediterranean, yeah, yeah. and lots of what, what came after in terms of big influential civilizations also came from the Mediterranean. So, Oh, very, very much. Basically, basically, and it's something that'll come up later, especially in some of the battles. Greece has lots and lots of islands and lots and lots of mountains, and they don't have very much farmland, so they just have to, they have to spread out a bit. Oh, they do, they do. But like, to put in perspective, like one of the Greek virtues is to be able to swim. That's an important thing. It is actually considered like a father's duty to teach his kid to know how to swim because they live that close to ports and usually that close to the sea. There's always an exception and the exception to that rule tends to be the Spartans. They live a little bit more inland. Mm. But other than that, everybody else is pretty much a trader and they go from place to place bringing, you know, we'll say bringing some ideas with them. They usually end up bringing uh, grapes with them as well because they're big fans of wine. They actually identified that other cultures are different from them, that the Greeks drink wine, uh, the Celts drink like mead, and I think it's like the other barbarians drink some kind of fermented milk. They pretty much borrowed a lot of their ideas. Like the theorem of Pythagoras, that is actually stolen from another civilization. That is actually older. So if they get a lot of credit for inventing stuff, they more so should get credit for writing things down. And they should definitely, you know, give uh, credit where credit is due to another group of people who are very famous kind of colonizers and sailors, and they're the Phoenicians. And the Phoenicians brought pretty much the written word to Greece. They adopted a writing system. They adopted an alphabet that was used phonetically. So that's where we get that word from. And the Greeks took it, and supposedly the Phoenicians didn't really have much vowels in their language. So the Greeks added vowels, and then they just off to the races from that point. So when we think about the Mycenaean Greeks, these are the really, really early guys. These are the the Troy the Trojan Wars, the Achilles, that's pretty much where that kind of idea comes from. And they're pretty much shrouded in mystery because they do have older linear scripts, but they didn't really record anything else other than that. And after that point then, the whole thing seems to take shape and where we start getting some really important Greek information is when they decide to piss off the Persians. <laughs> Essentially, yeah. Yeah, I think it's, to set the scene basically at this time, you know, we've mentioned Greece, they spread out, had a lot of colonies. It's kind of exaggerating to refer to them as a unified front, because really their whole history is just warring city-states, extremely fragile alliances. Uh, if any one of them got a bit too powerful, the others might unify temporarily just to take the, them down a peg. But oh, yeah. Very, very fractured, too, lots of infighting. By comparison, the Persian Empire covered 5.5 million square kilometers. It would be the seventh largest country in the world if it was around today. Uh, it stretched... From the edges of the Balkans to the Indus River, so, you know, say modern kind of uh, yes. know, edge of Pakistan and India. Mm. Basically, just a huge, huge empire um, versus these tiny guys who live on little islands and rocks and can't stop fighting with one another. And, you know, some of which as well <laughs> were willing to ally with the Persians because that seemed like the sensible choice. <laughs> <laughs> of course it would. <laughs> um, I think... a. a, a yeah, a group of important people we need to mention are a particular group called the Ionian Greeks. Now, they're somewhat related to the Athenians, but they're around the, the coast of what would be modern-day Turkey. Yeah. And they were established there for quite some time as traders and idea makers and pretty much very intellectual. But within one lifetime, they saw the Persian Empire expand from a, from a backwater nothing to control, you know, all of that territory that Cahill just mentioned, that really kind of hit a, a shock to their system. And they, you know, they were like, you know what? Forget these guys. We really, really want to revolt because we're all about freedom and liberty and all that thing. So I suppose it's, it's the Ionian Greeks that really take off the Persians. And that's when like the giant David Goliath scenario seems to happen where it's these tiny founders of Western civilization, these little squabbling city-states that, you know, can't agree on, you know, what color the sky is decide that, like, you know what, maybe we should somewhat unify to possibly deal with the imminent threat that is Persia. Yeah, I suppose this this episode, I think we're going to be talking more about battles than we are about generals. Um, oh, definitely. We'll, we'll get yeah, into some yeah. reasons as we go, but I think we're going to start off perhaps uh, the... I don't know if you'd, you'd say what caused the uh, Greco-Persian Wars, mm -hmm. uh, but certainly a catalyst for them was the siege of Naxos. And as okay. mentioned, some of the Greek city-states wanted to side with the Persians. You had a dictator of one of them called Miltus, mm -hmm. who wanted 
to control this other city-state, Naxos, asked for a bit of Persian help. Okay. And uh, this one, it wasn't a huge Persian force. They just sent a small kind of one to help out their, their ally. It was a relatively even force. But the Persian-supported side did lose. They were repelled after about four months. Yes. And took very heavy casualties. Like, the history machine has them getting about 77% more casualties than they should have. So, oh, wow. Okay. One, this did not make the Persians happy, but two, it made the Greek colonies, as you mentioned, in Asia Minor kind of thing, and in the agency think like, you know what, maybe we can, we can push back at the Persians coming in here, taking yeah. our, taking our stuff. <laughs> so, uh, maybe, maybe it's an they, option. They decided, but, yeah. hey, it, it might be a huge empire, but we can take them on, right? This is a good idea. Let's go mess things up. <laughs> you know what it feels like? It's like that super heavyweight boxing champion, and there's some guy who's like, Actually, I saw his last fight, and he kind of uh, he got in a bit of trouble there, didn't he? He yeah. still won, but like uh, you know, <laughs> like yeah, I see. There's a little bit of a flaw there. Maybe we can exploit that flaw. That that's maybe what we could do. That's possibly an option. If we do focus a little bit on the the siege of Naxos, is there anything very particular about it? It did seem to have very heavy uh, casualty rates, but um, I suppose it ticked off the Persians. That's the big thing it did. It was it was the first bit of. Persia may be feeling out, expanding their kind of their reach and their control over the agency and over Greece mm-hmm. and Thrace and so on. Okay. And the fact that it didn't go well for them pissed them off a little bit. They were kind of disappointed. They didn't commit too much to it. You know, it was fairly yeah. even. It was about yeah. 8,000 versus 8,000. Um, mm-hmm. Persians suffered far heavier casualties than they should have ah, okay. Okay. Um, in their lines. And as I said, it kind of got Ionia going then. And it got Persia... Somewhat angry, it got the Ionians riled up, and it led mm. into the thing which I think really annoyed Persia, which was the siege of Sardis. Okay, and the siege of Sardis, if we if we talk a little bit more about this particular siege, I suppose um, the Ionian revolt is a bit of a cluster. Didn't really work. <laughs> but uh, the siege of Sardis, what makes this one more impressive, or what makes it more important? Well, this is one where the Greeks decided they'd attack the Persian city of Sardis. Uh, it yes. was a surprise attack. Okay. And they were repelled... But again, kind of messy, a lot of casualties. And in the process of the battle, the mm-hmm. city got set on fire. So okay. it was kind of no good to anyone after that. And that's the thing. It's like they, the Greeks didn't succeed in taking it over, but they did succeed in wrecking the joint. Um, and Persia were like, you know what? <laughs> this, is too, this is too much trouble. Yeah. We need to just go fully commit and wipe the Greeks out because they are just being too annoying here. Jesus Christ. They're like a tick sticking, you know, like yeah. sucking blood from the side of you. You're like, I need to deal with this right now. This yeah. is going to be a big, big, big problem. So in terms of like, in terms of, you know, like Persians, yeah. they won that siege. They repelled it. And the mm. history machine like thinks they should have won it. It's not a huge surprise, but it's just, okay. it caused them way more trouble than it should have in the process. Ah, definitely. Okay. So the siege of Sardis, which it looks like the history machine seems to be giving pretty much even across the board. Uh, other than I can see a figure here for the casualties dealt is also 0.781. Yeah, the Greeks got hit hard by it as well in the, in the process. Like the, the Persians maybe overreacted given how badly the Greeks came off in this. They lost almost 80% more people than they should have according wow. to the history machine. Yeah, yeah. So that we'll say the first battle, the siege of Naxos, was pretty much where the the Persians attacked a Greek city and did a lot of damage. And then the siege of Sardis, where the Greeks had a surprise attack, they pretty much did a similar attack again, where a lot yeah. of people also Basically, died. Basically, it's kind of just the steady ramping up of like, yeah. the, the border is beginning to form between these two zones of power. And it's just kind of ramping up and up and up uh, at this stage. Okay, okay. So uh, then, you see, the, I think after this, uh, the Persians decide to get some revenge for Sardis, and they have another battle against uh, the Greeks, and this is the um, Ephesus. Yeah, and this is maybe where I think they're really becoming aware of one another, mm. and this was revenge for Sardis. It was attacking the Greeks who were retreating from there, okay. um, and the Persians really just wiped them out. Again, uh, in this case, more than 80% more casualties on the Greek side than expected. Yeah, yeah. Um, and you saw... You know, if you want to go through what, are, what was the Persian Empire good at in terms of battle, you have cavalry and archers. Yes. So basically, speed. And when mm-hmm. you're going against a tired, retreated force, yeah. they just got wiped out. The Persians destroyed you. them, and they did what they were best at in the process. And this was the Greeks learning, basically, like, 
this is how exactly we cannot fight the Persians. Uh, okay, if we keep doing okay. this, we will be gone in yeah. no time. Now, I'm actually going to introduce a little bit of a bullet point about the Persians in general. Now, they have a very specific kind of army that is famous for two things, as you've mentioned, the cavalry and the bow fire. And the reason that they're big for that is, if you can imagine, they've evolved a particular style of play. So in the same way that particular countries play football in particular ways, you're like, oh, Spanish football, that's about scoring a lot of goals. And, you know, German football, maybe that's a bit more defensive. You look at that, the kind of warfare that the Persians played was they needed a lot of bow fire because they had a lot of people and they also had excellent horses. And most of their opponents would have been heavy cavalry armies like Scythians or like proto-Mongols as well, for want of a better term, other nomads, other people that are giving them hassle. And when you have that many archers and that much bow fire and your enemies don't have that much armor, like it's just, you're just raining death on them and it works tremendously well. But when it comes then to the Greeks, these guys are a little bit different because the Greeks are very heavily armored and I'll talk about this in a moment but they're very heavily armored and they're almost the rock to the scissors in the in in the game it's like oh no wait a second this is our hard counter here we're not really sure how we deal with them so there's less of them but they're hard they're much harder to deal with so the Persians are like the big bad guy they well that's the way it seems to be put across by the Greeks because these are the guys who write about them they're very heavy in the bow fire they have excellent horses and um the next stage, I suppose, is the Siege of Eritrea. Before going to that, just while we're on the topic, maybe, of the different compositions, I think at this point it would be good to mention, because you're noticing by now anyway, and I mentioned earlier, we're mm-hmm. really focusing on the battles, not the generals in this one. And I thought we might go into our theories as to why. Like, if we, going through the history machine, there were very few Greek generals that really stood out or that had lots of battles. Yeah. And I think that's quite odd, because the thing with Greeks is that they wrote so much down. Mm. Like, they really... You know, that's, that's part of why we still talk about them so much. It's just they, they wrote so much down. And normally when you have civilizations write lots down, you get the big names, the big that is very generals true. and so on. Whereas, yeah, from, from what we've seen so far, very few generals, there are a few who maybe have one big battle and then they just won't show up again. Whereas this podcast, mostly big names are going much, very much in the great man theory of history. Mm-hmm. This is really, I, th- I think one of the reasons that we're getting fewer big names is just... The systems are what helped the Greeks against the Persians rather than individual yeah. brilliance. It's the, it's the individual men in the army and the way that they were trained and the way they were equipped that seemed to be the important parts. Now, don't fret, listeners, because we will start talking about very significant people soon, but these people will not really appear on the stage yet for Greece. Uh, or for any of the Greek city-states. These are kind of the early points. It's also kind of important to mention that the Greeks are riddled with generals. As in, whenever they assemble an army, they might have 10 or 12 or 15 generals, and they're squabbling, and they're childish, and they're arguing with each other. And there's a lot of people maybe trying to make names or trying to make themselves more important, but no one seems to actually properly stand out. And even particularly in Athens, they used to democratically elect their generals. So the whole idea is you could have been elected as a general and then you mightn't be elected next year. Yeah. So, so they might we won't have a hear big win again. in one battle, but then they're, they're out, of the, out of power the next exactly. year in a few yeah. months' time. So yeah. it doesn't matter. And I think it is, it's this, it's the, there does seem to be a Greek attitude of not trusting anyone who gets too big for their boots, both oh, on a national thing. level and on an individual level. Yeah. And then as you're saying, the different the advantages of both sides, Greek had very good sailors and mm-hmm. very good heavy infantry. Yes. Persia had good cavalry and good archers. Yeah. When yeah. you're dealing with mountainous islands, you want the heavy infantry and you want the sailors, whereas cavalry and archers are going to struggle a lot more. They're hindered by that terrain. So we have this combination of factors, which I think is just... Yeah. It's, it's maybe making it that it is more of the Greek mm. systems in place rather than Definitely. these single generals that Definitely. Helped win them the war in the end. Now, I think we pretty much can't go any further unless I start explaining what a phalanx is. Uh, Now, when we talk about the Greeks and that they have heavy infantry units, the idea behind that is the Greeks seem to have a very almost uniform unit type. And that type is called a hoplite. And a hoplite translates literally as a shield man. Now, hoplites, turns out, was really accredited to the Greeks for the longest time, but it turns out that the Sumerians had an earlier version of it, and it's likely they adopted it from them. But um, there's still also a good chance that they adapted the rules, changed it up a little bit, you know, altered the formation, just gradual evolution and, and, and changes to it. But what a hoplite is, is a man carrying a very round bronze shield, on his left hand and his right hand he might have an eight to ten foot spear might even be longer it does gradually get longer historically 
And then he also is armed with uh, armor that he has to purchase for himself because it is generally a militia. Um, there are a few exceptions, but we'll come, we'll come to that. So you're armored, you have a helmet, uh, you have a very heavy shield, and then you have a long spear. And a big thing about this formation is it is men lined up together very close and it is eight ranks deep. Now, what I mean by ranks is the guy who is in the front line, the very front person who's about to face the enemy, the very back line is is the eighth man behind him. So it's a guy in the eighth line at the back is the back of it. So that's what we mean by eight ranks deep. Now, each man is holding a heavy shield, and he uses that shield to actually cover the man on his left. But he's also covering himself to an extent, but he's also partially overlapping the man on his left. And his right hand, then he has the spear. But that means that the man to his right is actually overlapping him with his shield. So he gets a little bit of that extra protection. So it's like, okay, he's my buddy here to the right is overlapping me and I'm overlapping the guy to the left. So that means then that the guy at the very far right-hand side of a phalanx or the whole line down is actually not really covered by a shield. They're protecting the man to the left, but they only have their spears to the right. This area is generally reserved for people who, you know, want to be a hero, um, sometimes nobility, and it is by far the most, and generally sometimes veterans as well, but it's by far the most dangerous part to be in a phalanx. You do not want to be on the very far right-hand side because that historically is where the other guy is going to smash right into you because it's where you're least protected. A second thing to notice about the phalanx, pretty much what the Greeks did to it, is they decided to put family members and friends together in close formation. And the reason for that was it was trying to prevent you from running away. So actually, Carl, I'm just going to say this right now. Could you actually imagine if you had a friend or a family member beside you and they're covering you with their shield and they decide to hightail it? (laughs) So, yeah. So a lot of people reckon that is why like this formation worked so particularly well for the Greeks, because you've got a close knit community beside each other. You are not just fighting for your own life, but you're protecting the person beside you. And your life is pretty much being protected by another person beside you who's also trying to protect you. And the whole thing is close knit, very tight formation, block them in, heavy armor. Peer pressure, peer, peer pressure. <laughs> peer pressure is, the, is how the phalanx works. So, and you're also carrying very long spears that you're about to you're about to absolutely stab into the opponent. And if the spear does break, which they broke lots of times, you also had a two-foot sword that you carried on you if you needed to pull that out and start killing people. So what's very important about the phalanx as well is it's not spinny fighting. It's not guys running around slashing and parrying and do whatever. It's a close-knit community with a heavy overlap of shields ready just to keep stabbing. That's, that's what they're doing. And it works really, really well. And it seems to work really, really well against the Persians. And we'll mention that now when we get to some of the later battles. But um, So uh, where we are now, yeah. wrapping up the Ionian Revolt, which was the kind of the, what's considered the first stage of the Greco-Persian Wars. Uh, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to mention the first significant general that popped out of the history machine here with uh, right. Dionysius of Phocaea, which I'm probably mispronouncing. But uh, he's, he is the worst... Greek general of the Greek Greco Persian Wars, according to the history machine, who had more than one battle. Right. He lost the aforementioned Battle of Sardis, and he lost the follow up uh, Battle of Lade, which was okay. a naval battle. And unlike Sardis, they actually had a pretty, they had decent numbers in this one, still outnumbered by Persia, but like it looked on paper like they had a decent chance. Um, okay. Because it was kind of, you know, a bit back and forth up to this mm-hmm. point. But uh, allegedly at this battle, uh, and this is kind of, the real world reports backing up what the history machine felt about him. Like Dionysius did not do a good job. Apparently in preparing for the battle, he overworked his men to the point that they just refused to engage the Persians when the battle actually happened. They just, they would not do anything. And uh, he finishes with wins, wins over expectation of minus 2.3. So about a quarter worse than your average general. Oh my God. And so he, casualties, <sighs> his casualties suffered over expectation was about two thirds more than you would expect. Jesus, like per Christ. battle, it was, it was about sixty-seven percent worse yeah. than, so than you would want. So, uh, not a, not a good start. This wraps up the Ionian revolt. Like that was it crushed, and that, yes. then the Persians decided we we're going to commit a yeah. six-figure force to taking out Greece. We are going to go in heavy. We are going to fully invade now. 
Yeah, this this is where it goes. Yeah, this is it's time to now to punish the Greeks. This is yeah. like the the tick that has been sucking blood in the side. It's time to swat it off. This this, this is the next step. Yeah, this begins with the siege of Eritrea on our database. Okay. So. okay, yeah. So the siege of Eritrea. I suppose what's really important to note about this one it it is the battle before Marathon. So it's it's the setup before it. And um, other than this that, this battle yeah. this battle kind of went how I think people thought Marathon would go and how the rest of the war would go. It was basically setting up, we are the Persians, we are way bigger than you. Mm. Um, History Machine doesn't give a huge win over expectation yes. for the Persians winning this. It's only about like, it gave them about an 80% chance to win the first place. Okay. But they did almost 85% more casualties than expected. Like oh, The wow. Greeks were hit hard. Persians hit harder than they would have liked as well. They had about 11% more casualties than they'd want. But like, seriously damaging yeah. battle um it just established yeah. persians were big dominance and from here they're going on to marathon yeah what is greece going to do about it pretty much okay so marathon is one of these legendary battles this is the very important one to talk about uh now we will talk about its commanders but i think it's very important to lay the groundwork for it itself the ionian revolt has happened the persians have punished the Ionian Greeks for this. And now Marathon is where they're going to land and the Athenians have to really show face and see what they can do about this. So a couple of things to note about Marathon. There was a runner sent, but it was sent before the battle and it was sent to Sparta. And they said, listen, Sparta, we need some extra men here because the Persians are invading. And if they invade, you know, they're going to sack us and they're going to destroy our city. But they're going to come for you next. They're going to come for other areas of Greece. We really need your help. The Spartans, and this is a common theme among Sparta, they refused to go because they had a religious festival. They like will not go anywhere if it's like, ah, oh, no, sorry, it's uh, Christmas. Can't do that. <laughs> <laughs> they just, if there's a religious festival, bank holiday, they would, yeah, bank holiday, bank holiday. Yeah, we can't, can't do it. So if there's a religious festival, they can't do it. So the runner who was sent ran a couple of hundred kilometers over a space of a few days, came back to the Athenians and kind of said, um, sorry, Spartans won't come. So we're stuck by ourselves. And the Athenians are like, okay, this is uh, not the best situation we think we'd find ourselves in, but we'll work with it. So so what they did is, do you remember that eight rank formation I was telling you about? The eight men, men deep. I was mentioning in the phalanx. So the spearmen were their eight men deep. For Marathon, they decided for the very edges, they would keep it eight men deep. But for the center, they would reduce it to four because what they needed to do was two things. One, they needed to match the Persian line because the Persians were a much longer line. So it's like, we can't let them outflank us because they've got way more cavalry. They've got better, you know, they've got lighter skirmishers. They could just encircle us and envelop us and we're going to be a bad situation. So we need to match their line and we also need to minimize the amount of time that bow fire is going to hit us. So... They're like, okay, you know, if we're going to engage the Persians, we can't like walk into battle, which you would normally do. It's like, because we're just going to get mowed down by arrow fire. Um, so I suppose this is the best time now to introduce the general who is in charge of Marathon. And uh, do you want to give a little bit of specifications about him, Cotton? Themistocles, mm-hmm. one of the big uh, standouts. And as mentioned, there are not that many. For, the, no- for mm-hmm. the number of generals we have, there are very few that really stand out. Themistocles is one of the ones, and he's one of the big names, I think. He... Definitely fought. It's not 100% certain if he commanded. Yes. Something he did, something he didn't uh, at Marathon. He definitely stands out as one of the generals, and he also commanded at, at another mm-hmm. huge battle we'll talk about soon, the Battle of Salamis. In our database, he had, he had uh, three battles. He had two wins and one draw. Uh, so his overall score is held down a little bit by that draw, but overall the history mm-hmm. machine gives some wins over expectation per battle of 0.66. So the average general is zero. So he's you know about two thirds better mm-hmm. than your average. Very much stands out. And yeah, was was one of the big names. Managed yeah. to show up at two of the two mm-hmm. of the really big ones. Uh, he had the draw at the Battle of Artemisium, but uh, <laughs> definitely one of the highest. Oh, okay, rated okay. Well, geez, of that's all the really Greek good. Generals. So I suppose he's very key now for the Battle of Marathon. He's probably the guy who's one of the important to it. But it's believed that he possibly came up with the strategy. Of what is just about going to happen? So. As I mentioned, the Greeks have a very long line of four men deep to hold the center, and then they have a very strong eight man deep scenario on the right and the left. And they decide that uh, they're going to attack the Persians, which at the time the Persians are really, you know, confused because they're like, okay, with a smaller force running at us, what is this nonsense? So they get ready. They get ready to attack them. What happens next is pretty important. Two things that should be noted. Number one. 
there is a historical footnote that possibly the Persian cavalry was away. If that was indeed the case, and they were like, listen, we don't have the cavalry to match the Persian cavalry. We don't have the horsemen to match them. And now is our best chance to actually attack them. So that's definitely like the important thing that if that was the case, the Greeks or the, the Athenians had to and definitely did like, this is our opportunity. Go, go, go. So what makes this battle very strange is the Athenians ran into battle at some point. So they decided that like they had to cover a certain amount of ground. They need to minimize that rate of fire. And uh, they ran the last, the last couple of hundred yards or so. And when they did, then they smashed into the Persians. Now, the Persian middle line is usually kept there by the elite Persian infantry. So these are not guys necessarily with, uh, that are just bowmen. These are people who are actually very well trained and have spears and shields. And it is believed that the Greeks actually had a very hard time dealing with the center line because uh, they had to deal with the elite troops. But the right and the left found, found it, was, it was easy pickings and they were able to actually envelop both sides. Now, what an envelopment is, if you have the two lines of the armies and we'll say one edge or one wing of them decides to kind of curve around and gets to the back of the enemy and kind of wraps around them. And a double envelopment is where you do that on both sides. Now, this is extremely rare. So when it happened to the, to the Athenians, they were like, this is the best possible scenario we could have had here, that our center line managed to hold and our right and our left smashed in and around and enveloped the Persians. And to the Persians themselves, they were like, what is going on? This is a terrible scenario. And they immediately then retreated to the boats. So I mentioned a bit earlier about the runner. And it turns out that the, the urban legend that most people hear is after this battle, the Athenians sent a runner from Marathon to Athens to say, we won. And then he collapses and dies from exhaustion. That's not actually the case. But what, what actually did happen is kind of more impressive. It turns out the Persians did hop on their boat they did decide to sail to Athens. And the reason they were doing it is they wanted to kind of sail there and almost say that they had won or get Athens to actually surrender. Because it's like, oh no, the Persian army is here. We must have lost. Time to surrender. But what the Athenian army did then was they decided to say, we have to run or jog or get back to Athens before the fleet do. And they did. And then there was a scenario where the Persians landed up at Athens, pulled up the boat and go, oh no, that army that just, that just beat us. It's kind of a funny case where the big legendary story is way less impressive than either A, the individual runners who went to Sparta, who ran hundreds of kilometers, not just 42, like running 42 and then collapsing and dying. That would not have been a good runner. They were expected to go much further. Or B, the alternative origin, the entire army running the 42 kilometers. Like either way, the reality way more way cooler than the legend that's built up so and uh before we move on just want to say as well this as well as uh the Mistocles, this battle also introduced another big general um only two battles in the database but the best uh mm -hmm. greek general in the greco persian in the greco persian wars uh who had more than one battle uh xanthippus his wins over expectation was 0.82. So like he was only in two battles, but in each battle he was given less than a 20% chance to win. Um, so like when you consider it, like he only won two, but the odds of him winning both of those was mm -hmm. about 3%. So he was, he was involved in Marathon, which was a big upset, and yeah. Michael, which another big upset we'll get into later. Yeah. And another fun fact with Xanthus, another reason he's so significant, he was mm -hmm. the father of Pericles. And Pericles is known as the father of Greek democracy. He was an Athenian statement and one of the biggest deals in, <laughs> in Greek history. history yeah. Possibly all history generally when you consider the ramifications of that. So, um, yep. big, big deal, Xanthippus. Yeah. And uh, the, the computer recognizes it. That's great. Really thinks. Yeah. Uh, 0.82 wins over expectation. Casualties dealt out to the enemy. Mm -hmm. uh, about 55% more than expected. Ah, okay. So serious damage dealer. Oh, well. wow. So he's a serious damage dealer. He, like, let's say if there is... who When a normal general would kill two opponents, he, he's killed three. And his, yeah. his odds to win are just astronomically high, as in it's an 80% chance above the average. If you need someone to command with the back against the wall in, like, seriously difficult situations, he's not a bad one to, That's really to good. For. Yeah. So I suppose we, we, we're going through the battles almost systematically. And the next one, which uh, is going to be fantastic, and I'd like to talk a lot about it, 
uh, because it is it is one of the most famous battles of all time. And I can talk and drone on a little bit about the commander for a while. This is the Battle of Thermopylae. This is this is the battle that everyone remembers as the famous last stand. It's the 300 Spartans taking on the supposed million men Persians, which is probably like the quarter of a million. Still, the number is way too high. Yeah. Still, yeah. It's still like, even with modern day estimates, you're talking about yeah. maybe, yeah. you know, five to 10,000, yeah. probably around like 7,000 mm-hmm. versus like one to 300,000. So oh, big time. Yeah. It's a huge difference, even if you don't exaggerate. It's a massive, massive difference. It's absolutely insane. So after Marathon, the Persians were a little bit kind of, uh, they had a bit of an upset. Now, I'd say the Greeks recorded that as a much bigger thing than, than what it was. You know, it might have just been, oh, we lost that small skirmish. That was the case. We'll come back to it later. But they did decide to come back to it later. And it was actually an, a new Persian emperor called Xerxes who, just, who was going to invade and lead the invasion. And they came across with this massive monumental army that was going to punish Athens. It was going to level parts of Greece. It was going to try and incorporate a lot of Greece into the Persian Empire. This was going to be the smasher, the absolute wrecker, like the destroyer of Greek civilization that would have been there. This is the army that's coming. And the guy in charge of this, or the guy who's in charge of the Battle of Thermopylae, is Leonidas. Now, Leonidas is a Spartan king. Now, the Spartans are really unusual because if you think the Athenians have democracy, the Spartans actually have a completely different type of government altogether. And it is super conservative. It's got a lot of checks and balances and it's a diarchy, which means they have two kings. Now, I'm going to talk a little bit about the Spartans just to explain where this all comes from. The Spartans claim descendancy from Hercules, from Hercules's twin sons. And because he had twin sons and they set up this area in Lacedaemonia, which is Sparta, it's the kingdom there, that they said, we have to have two kings, one from each line. And that is how they will govern and that's how they will rule. So it's like, okay, that's, that's how they're, they're going to function. They, so they always have two kings and um, those kings come from each of those direct lines and they'll always fill that position. The Spartans also have a somewhat elected, I wouldn't say democratically elected, but they have an elected group of five officials known as the Ephors. And they are young Spartans who are meant to follow the kings and see what is going on with them and to make sure that they don't break any laws, to make sure they don't abuse their power. And there's five of them and they're elected every year and you can't hold the position again. And these efforts can get together with a three to two majority and they can decide to exile the king or punish him or put him on trial and do that kind of thing. And at the same time, then the Spartans also have a council of elders and they have like the ability to veto and they have the ability to uh, to call trials and they're jurors and it gets gets really messy. So there's this convoluted system of elders, elected officials and a diarchy. So the whole thing is a cluster at that plus religious festivals and observing them. Like the whole, their whole system is just very hard to get around. It's really rigid and it's hard to get anything done or changed. And uh, Leonidas then, with all of that in mind, did visit the Oracle at Delphi and the Oracle put forward a prediction that in order for Greece to survive, a Spartan king would have to die. And he's like, okay, now say what you want about the Spartans. They're very religious in terms of they follow this stuff right. They believe this. This is very important. They, they are very pious. They won't, they won't go to battle when there's meant to be a religious festival. They won't do something when, you know, you know when there's any kind of contradictions, like bank holidays, we're not doing anything. This is, this is what's going to happen. So Leonidas actually breaks the rules for Thermopylae when he does this because there is a religious festival in Sparta. Now, maybe the Persians timed this, which would be amazing. Uh, but uh, another thing to note is the Persians actually do have advisors for Greece, on Greece, and one of them is an exiled Spartan king. So he probably knew about this event. This is very much speculation now, but he probably knew about this event. It was like, yeah, this would be a great time to strike. Like, they have a religious festival right now, so they can't possibly show up for it. But Leonidas breaks the rules when he gets 300 Spartans. All of them have fathered sons, which is an important thing. He's like, all of you have, have fully grown sons, so you know we can die in this. Uh, Leonidas himself is over 50. So you're like, wow, okay, he's really going into this into this situation. Like, and fifty in the ancient world is like being seventy, you know. Yes. So he's <laughs> so he's he's quite old. He's bringing a bunch of middle aged men with him. You'd call them veterans if you're being nice, but really, uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and they're they're, they're they're with several thousand other Greeks who think this is a great idea, and they're going to fight at Thermopylae, which translates as the Hot Gates. And what Thermopylae is is a super narrow pass that has the sea on one side 
and it has kind of very rugged high mountains on the other. And it's also famously meant to be the area, according to the Spartans, where Hercules did die. Or Heracles would be his name. Hercules is the, the Roman equivalent. But it's where Her- Heracles is meant to have died. And it, it's kind of believed that possibly Leonidas had, one, a death wish. Uh, two, he wanted possibly to make a point. Uh, three, he could have been absolutely crazy. <laughs> four, he wanted to die with glory. Uh, five, he wanted to die where Heracles died. And like it, it just the list seems to go on, but there's, there's almost no explanation for why they would hold it here or strategically why it's so important. It's a fantastic place. If the Greeks could have got their could have gotten their stuff together and gotten themselves organized. It would have been a great place for thousands of thousands and thousands of Greeks to hold, but they didn't. They chose not to do that. Uh, for, what, for whatever reason, they weren't there. It was only a couple of thousand of other Greeks and the 300 Spartans, and they were going to hold this place. So I suppose we need to talk about how Leonidas fared here, and importantly, how did they do? How did the Greeks in total do in the battle? Yeah, well, as you said, they were never going to win this. Uh, Leonidas, he only has one battle in the database, which was this one. But he yeah. has probably the best record of any general to not win a battle. Okay. Because it was, it was just a given he would not win. So <laughs> yeah, he took yeah. practically no damage to his wins over expectation. <laughs> okay. He's still very close to, like, just zero. Yeah. When, you, when you adjust for error in the history machine, like errors with the neural network, Mm. It was basically like it basically said like yes Persia will win this it doesn't matter like mm. they are there is almost a zero percent chance that yes. the Greeks would win this yeah it it is it is the funny thing like from the Greek point of view and from often Western European point of view like the Battle of Thermopylae it's famous you know the famous last stand the people holding out knowing they die but doing what they could to protect their country whereas for Persia it was just like. That took a little bit longer than I would have liked, but sure, <laughs> past yeah. it now anyway. Like, you know, Grant, we'll move on. Um, you know, it's, it, they, they took more casualties than they should have. Still a tiny percentage of the, the army. overall army because yeah. they had such a huge armory. Mm-hmm. It was a good, you know, in absolute numbers, the Greeks did do some damage, but it was nothing really to the Persians. Yes, um, yes, yes. In all likelihood. Okay, but, um, yeah. Yeah, it was, it was su- sufficient anyway just to maybe... Mm being a bit of a moral victory for the Greeks. And, you know, I, yeah. I suppose they don't care what the Persians thought of it if they didn't mm. notice that it was important for uh, yeah. the Greek uh, story and for motivating people to keep fighting. There's probably a very good chance as well that Leonidas took on this battle as a bit of a political point to explain to people, like, this is a big threat. They are coming. They are going to kill a lot of us. Uh, because he did break huge... Uh, we'll say religious taboo right now, there was a festival in Sparta and he chose to leave from there and he shouldn't have. So it would have been deemed unconstitutional for him to do this, but he did it anyway. So there must have been some much more important political reason for why it was done, why he only went with such a few small amount of men. Maybe he was making a point. Maybe he wanted to die gloriously. You know, the whole thing of like, we're talking about him now. So he was definitely remembered if that was the goal. So, but it it is, it does fill the imagination, this particular battle, because it's just meant to be the 200 or 300,000 Persians taking on a couple of thousand Greeks, 300 of them being Spartans. And the last stand is pretty much when, when the Persians do eventually envelop the Greek forces, the remaining Greeks flee except the Spartans. They're going to hold off as like, we're going to be the people who let you get away. Yeah. This, is, this is our role. This is the last stand. This is what we're going to do. There's us here. We're going to let everybody like evacuate, go, tell them, tell them what happened, um, you know, rally the troops, yeah. whatever you got to do. But like, we're all going to die here gloriously. The one, the one thing you could say for the, for mm. the Greek effort in this and yeah. Leonidas and Spartans effort in this, it was yeah. really, what's the best ratio we can get of damage done to actual resources committed Mm -hmm. you know like they put forward very few they had very little losses they you know it wasn't much damage overall but like for the amount that they put into it they did a lot they did as much as you could hope for yes um but it's still too small interestingly Mm -hmm. and i think an interesting comparison and thing to talk about was a battle that was actually going on at the same time as thermopylae which Ah, is the naval battle of Artemisium. Now, um, I just want to pause for two seconds about Artemisium. Do you remember we yeah. said that they had the sea on one side and they had the cliffs on the other? Well, you might ask, why, yes. if they couldn't get around these Greeks, why didn't the Persians just sail around them? 
And mm-hmm. this is the reason why. Yeah. Yeah. And this is, as I mentioned, uh, Themistocles, this is the draw that he has on his record. Yes. That kind of took him down yeah. a bit. But um, it was a draw. Mm-hmm. Uh, it wasn't a win for the Greeks. Again, like the, the Greeks had a very small odds to win this. They mm-hmm. they were only given about 20 to 30% chance by the history machine to win this. Yes. So coming away with a draw was a positive. Um, however, like saying like, well, why isn't that talked about as much as Thermopylae? Look at Thermopylae mm-hmm. and as you said, very little committed. Art- Artemisium, you had similar yes. casualties on both sides in absolute numbers. Mm-hmm. Like the Greeks gave as good as they got. But the thing was the Persians had such a bigger army, like it really hurt the Greeks to lose Mm-hmm. That that number, whereas the Persians they could keep going. So while it was a better result than expected, yeah, um, you know, even even for a draw, it was, it was mm-hmm. that was you know as good a result as they could hope for. The casualties were just a bit more. History Machine has it about twenty percent more than they should have taken, maybe would have yeah. liked to have taken. So it, this kind of hurt the Greeks a little bit. Still, you know, positive result, but not positive enough. I suppose. Oh yeah, so definitely, definitely. Now I think what's important to mention about. Uh, Themistocles is he was an Athenian statesman and general but what's very important to note about him is the Athenians a couple of years before this battle came across a windfall of some silver mines they're like we've got all of this excess money what do we do with it and he being like the really shrewd politician he he falls into this category of that politician that gets those roads built or the buildings done or he's that guy it's like oh you know Themistocles he's the guy He's going to get that built for me, or he'll get that hospital built, or he'll get that whatever. Sure, he's, isn't he the guy who got that grant through? Like, he falls into that kind of category. And what he did was, through a bit of political shenanigans, he was able to say, how about we spend this money on having an amazing navy? Because we're probably going to get an invasion soon, and it would be really good that us, being a port city, would have a fantastic navy and, you know, sail around the Mediterranean, do our stuff, have trades, and, and not be, you know, under fear. And it's after this he sets up the Athenian reputation of having a great navy. Now, further down the line, it'll be the Athenian navy that pretty much makes Athens a superpower. And he is the person who says, let's get some of this money and we'll spend it and we'll have a navy. And it's like, oh, what a coincidence. This navy turns out to be very useful and perhaps I should be in charge of some of it. Yeah. And uh, an appropriate thing to talk about because we're going to mm. move forward now. If Marathon's maybe the most significant land battle, this is probably the most significant naval one. Oh, definitely. This is the Battle of Salamis. Yeah. And this happened not long after Thermopylae and Artemisium. Mm-hmm. And same idea again. They were going to try and funnel the Persians into a narrow area where they couldn't make use of their mm. extra size. It was yeah. almost put, you know, taking their size, turning it against them. Um, of course. This is what happens when it goes as mm. well as possible. Yeah. Um, now, actually, I'm, I'm going to talk a teeny bit more about it. Uh, Themistocles, uh, being like the very shrewd politician he was, actually spread rumors to the Persians that the Greeks were in dire straits. They were in a bad situation. They were huddled up in this area. They would nowhere to go. They were localized into this small geographical area. They were stuck. They were desperate. They were going to evacuate. And the only way to prevent the Athenians escaping is surround them, take them out, kill them all. And that was pretty much a counter rumor that they spread to the Persians when in the whole time the plan was we need to get the huge amount of Persian ships into this narrow strait and then we engage them. Yeah, this is... I think probably why Themistocles yeah. is a big name, is this battle. So yeah, big, big underdogs and mm-hmm. executed perfectly. This is where the Persian forces were lured into a narrow area and they couldn't use their size. The politician that is um, that is Themistocles kind of spread rumors about it. It was like, come on, come in here. This is our only way to get out. We're trying to escape. We need to flee. Please don't surround us. Please don't come into here. And of course they did. A lot of experts will probably say that Salamis is probably the most important battle yeah. in this that was the whole engagement. Point, not yeah. Thermopylae. Yeah. Thermopylae is the one where it's like, it. oh, listen, they steamrolled over us. Oh, la da da. You know, maybe remember the guys who fought to the last man. Mm. But there's a phrase by, I think it's um, George Patton. He's an American general World War II. But he's like, no one ever won a war by dying for their country. So like, that sounds like Patton. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. But it's like you don't. So the whole thing is, you got to you got to beat the other guy. And Salamis is where they beat the other guy. This is where they give Xerxes, they give the Persian forces a huge upset. So I suppose, what does the history machine think of one of the most significant battles in Western history, the Battle of Salamis? So yeah, Battle of Salamis, Greeks won it with maybe about 23% chance okay. uh, to win. 
Mm-hmm. They did about 20% more casualties mm-hmm. than expected. They took, not by much, but they did take fewer casualties than expected as well. Yes. And um, yeah, I, th- I think the history machine backs us up. This is actually, I think, a l- joined with Marathon, the biggest upset victory for the Greeks. This was the one where they had the lowest odds and still came out as the winners. Okay. Along with Marathon. Right. And they still did it. They still pulled it. They pulled this one out of the bag. Wow. Absolutely. Wow. Yeah. So I suppose when we did focus on Salamis there, the next battle, when we think of the Athenians and we think of that was the big naval victory, this allowed a very important land battle that was going to happen. And this is what Herodotus, who is a Greek historian, writer, poet, he says is Sparta's finest moment. And this is the Battle of Plataea. So yeah. what, what happens is the Persian army has gotten into Greece. It's passed through Thermopylae. It's they actually sack and destroy Athens. They move on. The Thebans have united with them. This is another Greek city-state that if there's three big city-states in Greece, it's Athens, Sparta, and Thebes. And Thebes have decided we're going to fight on the side of the Persians. Thebes are basically like the third place maverick who really want to be one of the big guys. Oh, they do, they um, do. And, it, and that'll come back later on as well. <laughs> yeah, yeah, big time. So, <laughs> definitely, definitely. So, um, so this is like the shining moment of Sparta the Battle of Plataea. So what it effectively is, is the Greeks are outnumbered about three to one. It could be more, they're not 100% sure. But what is important is, this is where the Spartans decide to take on a particular engagement of the Persians and they line up this phenomenal phalanx in the shining bronze armour. They're ready to go and they take a bit of arrow fire initially and they're kind of delaying and they're sitting there and they're waiting and they close the ground and they cut through the Persians like a hot knife through butter. Now, I have explained about the hoplites and about the Greek setup, what they're carrying, the shields, the heavy arm, the heavy armor, the long spears. What their opponents are wearing and using is outrageously under par. The Persians have wicker shields, if you can imagine. So they have a wicker shield and they're actually being stabbed by iron weapons. So it's cutting right through them. Now, a wicker shield will work very well against bow fire, but against anything else, no good. And this is where the Spartans smash into the Persians and just cut right through them. And the general in charge of this is probably, I'd say, and I think the history machine might agree with me, the best Spartan general they've ever had, and it's Pausanias. Uh, yeah. Pausanias, definitely, history machine points out one of the Big names again. As I mentioned, lots of the Greek generals, they have very average wins over expectation, mm-hmm. kind of hovering around zero. Posanius has uh, 0.57 okay. wins over expectation from two battles. Uh, you know, So uh, on average, if it was given... Mm-hmm. If he was given a 50-50 chance, he's going to win that. Yes. Like, you know, it's, it's, he's very, very strong. Um, he's particularly good. But th- very yeah. strong general. And this was... Mm. His big, his big moment, really. Yeah, and he really he shined across it. This is where, this is where he makes his name. This is where, like, yeah. this is where the. And as you said, mm. just the you know, like hot knife through butter. His his uh, average casualties dealt out was about forty five percent higher than you'd expect. Oh wow! And what did they take? So, like, about six percent fewer than you'd expect. Oh so, wow! Like, solid, yeah. solid defense. Now remember, solid defense, great, very good. Offense. Yeah, remember they're outnumbered nearly three to one here, and if this was a fifty fifty battle, he took six percent less than he should have. So it's like the numbers are crazy. So he's just, he is... Well, that's his average across the that's two. That's his average this across battle, the two, yeah. This battle, actually, I will highlight... Do, do. Some estimates give it as, as three to one. Yeah. Modern estimates, which I think we went with in the database, it's actually closer to maybe yeah. five to four ratio. It wasn't quite as dramatic. Yeah. And when you factor in, as you said, maybe the superior equipment mm. of the... Of the Greeks. Uh, Greek side. History Machine actually gave this to be roughly 50-50, very slightly in the Persians' favor. okay. But the casualties dealt out is where it's significant. The Greeks took about 10% fewer. In this battle, they dealt out 75% more than expected. Oh, wow. So they really... They really they cut right into them. them. In, in what should have been very close run battle, they absolutely dominated it. Yeah, yeah. And uh, in terms of overall significance to the war, this plus Michael are considered the ones that, like... This is it. This is the Greeks winning outright. Mm. This is the battle, as you said, Athens was taken. This is where they took back the province of Attica and the other province of yeah. So, like, this is the Greeks regaining control of things yeah. here. Oh, yeah. It's, it's incredible. It's, it is their shining moment. This is where the whole thing, like, they absolutely 
dominate. And it's where the Spartans make their name. Now, I think, and maybe the history machine could agree with me, from what we can see in the points and figures, we look at these particular Greek city-states, Thebes, Athens, Sparta, um, Argos, there's, there's a few other than them, but Sparta don't actually shine that well. And that might they don't be, they necessarily don't. They're, stand out. No. I think a lot of it was more reputation yeah. than just... Reputation and hype, really, yeah. seems, to, yeah. seems to be it. But like, it's not like a Spartan is worth four other men. It's not the case. It's just not, it's, it's not really. Now, they have a professional army, that is a big thing. They, then they have their men, they train them, and they constantly train them. And they train them from a young age, and they learn how to coordinate and move and fight. But they don't really stand out when it compares to other, to other troops as much. It's like they're a bit better, but they're, for the amount of work that must have been put in, it's not actually that much more of an improvement. It's probably better to simply have more men. I think, again, mentioning, uh, as we've said a few times, Greece, uh, in the Greek Greco-Persian Wars, they have so many generals and so few that really stand out. Mm. I think part of the reason, again, is for Greece's history, they're either going up against the Persians or the other Greeks Oh yeah, um, in, in the periods that we're kind of looking at. Definitely. So if they're having more than a few battles, mm. they're either going to be the underdog or it's going to be 50-50. It's very hard for ones to get up a string of wins in a row yeah. without taking any losses or draws. And it is the thing that just like the Spartans versus the Athenians versus the Thebans, like... It's going to be a similar, you know, there are certain things that they're better at or worse at, but it'll usually mostly balance out. Ah, okay. They're, they're, they're quite, compared to other, when you consider that, like, other armies at this time would have been, like, total barbarians, no... No coordination. You know, no, no tactics, yeah. no, just, like, running at you with whatever, you know, clubs they had, yeah. things think, like that. Like, think Braveheart. The Greek armies were far more <laughs> similar to one another than yeah. they were different, yeah, you know, yeah. was, it is, it is. They're, they're very similar. But in the same way, it's, it's kind of like how maybe some religious factions don't like each other, even though their difference between them is hair and fur. It's like, oh, they don't like each other because those guys have the tiniest difference to us. Um, yeah. These Greek city-states do have a bit of cultural difference. They have different accents, different dialect to a small extent. But ultimately, they're not a unified country yet. There, there is no Greece at this time. There are just warring city-states. But when they are invaded by a bigger, badder enemy, that is when they say, you know what? Time to unify, time to work together. And even with that said, there will be more Greeks fighting on the side of the Persians than there will be fighting to liberate or free Greece. So, like, say, say what any way you want. In fairness, in, if in their position, I would have definitely thought the Persians were going to win that. Yeah, yeah there's no way. <laughs> yeah. the, uh, in the, the outset, outset. You know, on the yeah. outset, I yeah. would have sided with yeah. Persia. Yeah. I, I'm not going to mm. yeah. say that they were wrong. Definitely. To do that. But even also, by the time of this Battle of Plataea as well, a lot of the Persian force, after they go to Athens and they burn it, they go to different regions looking for submission, and uh, a lot of that army will actually go home. And we're not really sure why they go home, the Persians. This is even before like the Battle of Plataea, a lot of them will go home. It might be because maybe there was a revolt, maybe there was a, a battle near the other side of the empire, uh, maybe they're just like, listen, the contingency we leave here will be enough, because, you know, we've destroyed, we've burned Athens, we've destroyed these various areas, we've subjugated these people, that's what we've done, it's all above board, everything is fine, just leave a small force here. Then the, the Spartans and the Athenians are like, okay, this is, this is our moment now to try and win it back. They do at Plataea, and they do very well. But that might be the case where it's just like a lot of the Persians did leave at this time. They're like, okay, time to go home. Again, just more, more trouble yeah. than it's worth, but on a yeah. far bigger scale than the oh, definitely. Ionian Revolt. Yeah, yeah. And um, worth mentioning as well, just as Thermopylae had Artemisium, Plataea had Michael as the corresponding, well, this in this case, more of a an amphibious battle where it was both land and sea. Ah, yes. Yes. More of a naval influence and bring back as well one of the highest ranked generals, uh, Xanthippus. Our boy Xanthippus. <laughs> the Battle of Mycal. And uh, yeah. yeah, Greeks outnumbered not as bad dramatically as some of the yeah. other battles, but still like about a two to three ratio. Um, mm -hmm. This one was a lot messier than Plataea, okay. um, which is maybe why it's not quite as well remembered. Greeks took a lot of damage as well. They took maybe 40% more than you'd like. Yes. But dealt out... 86% more oh, casualties than wow. expected. So really, like, the Greek Navy was, you know, it was really damaged by this battle, but it wiped out what was left of that Persian army. We're, we're talking about 60,000 men and about 300 ships pretty much gone. Jesus. For almost, you know, almost entirely after this one. So the kind of the double yeah. whammy of Michael and Plataea, it really, it just yeah. made the Persians decide, you know what, no, we're, we're done. 
And from this this point, really, you had you had the Wars of the Delian League, which is basically like Athens and its allies kind of mopping things up for the next fifty years. But this was the Greco Greco Persian Wars. Over. Done. This is it. Done. Yeah. Dusted. It's like, listen, Persia came here. They wanted to make some noise. They wanted to teach us a lesson. But it turns out, like, we won. So yeah, that's that's it. We're we're finished. But uh, I suppose that wraps up the uh, the Persian War, which is what we really wanted to cover the early Greeks to this Persian invasion for uh, this part of the podcast. But um, I just want to know if you don't mind. We mentioned a fair few generals there, and similar to episode one, I'd like to rank them from worst to best. Okay, of the so of the ones we mentioned today, mm-hmm. starting off with worst, we have Dionysius of Phocaea. Mm-hmm. Did just two battles, two losses. Uh, did terribly. Did uh, had a wins over over expectation of mm. minus point two three, and casualties yeah. suffered uh, mm. above expectation sixty seven percent worse than you would. Now, do we want, have a so. max elo rating for this person? Um, yeah, elo of uh, final elo of if the average is fifteen hundred fourteen eighty five. Okay, which is. A quick drop for only two battles. That's fair enough, yeah. So he's dropped quite significantly, so... But yeah, both battles took way, way heavier casualties than expected. Like, whatever, not necessarily expected to win, but my god did not protect his own men. (laughs) Yeah, dealt pretty poorly in that revolt. Okay, so our next general, and at number four, is... Leonidas, um, with wins over expectation of minus zero, zero, four. (laughs) Like... In other, basically, like, 99%, like, we don't know if he was actually a good or a bad general, because <laughs> no one was going to win that battle. That was an insane battle to I go into. I don't know, Carl. However, his casualties, casualties sustained yeah. um, about 27% better than you'd expect. Like, the fact that not everyone died, yeah. basically. <laughs> Big positive. Uh, casualties dealt out yeah. about 7% higher than expected, which, you know what, like, yeah. proportionally, not that impressive. Yeah. But when you consider it was a six-figure army, yeah. in absolute numbers, that's a lot of, yeah. a lot of I, th- I think uh, an important thing to note, actually, is the history machine thought it was an upset that the Persians didn't kill absolutely Everybody. Yeah, basically. That's, that's the easiest way to put it. Yeah. It's like, what? You let some get away? Are you out of your mind? Yeah. <laughs> like, oh, okay. So coming in at third place. Third place, we have Posanius, which, you know, as, as we mentioned. Yeah, was, the uh, fine Spartan known commander known for the Battle of yeah. Plataea. Absolutely huge damage dealer. Uh, on average, uh, dealt out 45% more casualties and sustained 7% fewer. Uh, 0.57 wins over expectation okay. on average. Um, you know what? Probably just based on those couple of battles, like probably would have ranked higher if he was involved in... In more. But yeah, it was basically like he, we only had two battles in the database. The other one, it wasn't as significant. And really, it was a given that he would win it. And I think it just dragged down his average because he wasn't challenged. But ah, Plataea, okay. as, as we said, you look at the stats for that one battle, you know, 74% more casualties dealt out than expected. Far fewer casualties sustained in what should have been a really close run 50-50 battle. Okay. Uh, very impressive. Getting better there. And coming in then at number, number two. two. Okay, so in terms of wins over expectation, we have two at the same. So I'm going to go by casualties to settle it. Number two, okay. I'm putting in Xanthippus. Point, point eight two wins over expectation. So like huge improvement. Um you know, basically, well, it, on average, is is two battles only a twenty percent chance, less than twenty percent chance to win. Wow, um, won both. But as we said, the Battle of Michal that was heavy real casualties upset. at that one. Yeah, yeah. He- heavy casualties. That's what drags him down. Like, did did a good bit of damage. Did mm. dealt out fifty five percent more casualties than expected, but yeah. just took a bit too many himself. Yeah, especially in in Michal. So it was it was Marathon that really made his reputation, and Michal is the yeah. one that uh, damaged it. Yeah, yeah, but again, and again, though, bonus points for being the father of Pericles. Pretty much, yeah. <laughs> pretty important. For Pre- pretty important historically whole. wise, yeah. And I suppose yeah. then, coming in at number one, the Olympic gold medalist. Themistocles. Um, nice, yeah. Reasonable, you know, solid, didn't take any more casualties than expected, yeah. dealt out about 20% more. Ah, yeah. Um, so he fought, he, uh, he fought at Marathon, at Marathon and, and Salamis. Salamis. So mm. I would say of the naval commanders, probably, yeah. Uh, Possibly the strongest yeah. there. So. I suppose we certainly have to give him so much credit because if Athens never built a navy, this war yeah. would have been over a lot quicker. The, yeah. We'll put it this way, 
the Persians could have just sailed to Sparta and burned that as well. They got they got Athens, but they didn't. They weren't exactly sailing around destroying everything. And it was only the Athenian navy that really stopped this from becoming an all-out super invasion that would just end with landing hundreds of thousands of Persians in Greece, conquering the place, taking it all over, killing men, enslaving women, doing you know whatever you needed to do. They could have done whatever they wanted, but it was ultimately the Athenian navy that stopped this, and that's why actually, he's got to come in first. I, I think this is an appropriate number one because, as we said, really it was the systems. The overall like strategies, the the type of uh, army compositions that the Greeks were using mm. that really helped win them yeah. win rather than the generals. Oh, definitely. So I think it only is appropriate to pick the number one general as the one who put so much of that in place. Oh, 100%. Yeah. So really, yeah, he's the guy. I think he comes in, he saves the day. He's the, he's the crafty politician, the guy who'll get the roads built for you, the guy who'll get the navy built. He'll build boats, he'll do what he needs to do. Like, But he really goes down as the top person. Of this era, definitely. And this might be considered... I don't know if we consider this the Greek golden era. Probably not. We got a lot there more a important things. There are ones you can consider, and mm. it kind of depends on your definition of Greek, especially yeah. before. <laughs> definitely, um, definitely, yeah, yeah. But yeah, I think we will we will move on to the next stage yeah. of Greek history uh, that followed on here. You had, you know, the Greco-Persian War here. Then what followed was several decades of unusual peace. Um, you had a fracture in the alliance yeah. that went after the Persians, where the... So following on from the Greco-Persian War, you had a split in the Greek alliance. The Athenians formed the Delian League um, mm-hmm. with their allies, the, the, and the Spartans formed the Peloponnesian League yes. with theirs. Mm-hmm. And uh, a peace lasted, you know, for the next 50 years, because they were just kind of busy... Yeah, of course. Uh, ...rebuilding, I suppose, and kind of mopping up some of the remaining mm-hmm. Persian colonies around the area, kind of reasserting control of the agency mm-hmm. and... Asia Minor and so on, but uh, things finally, tensions kind of mounted and things finally came to head in the Peloponnesian Wars, Mm -hmm. where the big two, Athens versus Sparta, faced off against one another, which is what we'll be discussing next time. Definitely. So look forward to it, because this one is definitely the highlight between the two great city-states of Greece, and the end result will pretty much leave a world open for a little northern kingdom well, actually, this is pretty much their little encounters that will leave the world open for other kingdoms to take centre stage in the Greek world. And uh, we'll be looking forward to that. So the Peloponnesian War, episode three. <laughs>